This video is supported by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. A kind of odd week this week with SpaceX discarding another Starship it seems. Full steam ahead on a new ship and some interesting insights into the lift points on the tower. A super busy week for SpaceX's Falcon 9 with another two Starlink launches, but there were some new changes to these missions. We have Northrop Grumman's launch of the Cygnus resupply mission to the International Space Station, but this is not a typical mission. Cygnus has another role to play. And then you. LA is not bidding on one of the largest launches of the decade. The Roman Space Telescope looks like it could go SpaceX's way. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. After Ship 20's multiple cryo tests last week, Booster 4 has also recently undergone a cryo test. The pad was cleared early in the morning and the orbital tank farm was already active at that time. Frost then formed on the liquid oxygen tank and rose all the way to the common dome before receding again. So yes, that one looked to have gone quite smoothly. Later that day, SpaceX then again began testing Mechazilla. This was seemingly a ship stacking simulation with the arms rising up the tower and then rotating back and forth once at the top. We then soon saw what was thought to be the start of Booster 8's stacking as its common dome section was lifted and placed onto the aft section number 2. However, later on it was instead removed and lifted out of the high bay. So yes, stacking had not yet started as originally thought. In fact, that aft section number 2 was also later lifted out of the high bay as well. Now, last week of course, Ship 22 was fully stacked in the high bay, and then since then it was moved outside and has had one of its aft flaps installed before being rolled back into the high bay. Later, it left again to allow workers to install the other flap. So yes, I was quite excited to see another fully stack finally occurring, but then Ship 22 unexpectedly entered Highway 4, and as beautifully shared by Starship Gazer, it was heading towards the rocket garden where the other retired or unused vehicles reside. Ship 22 arrived at the display stand area located at the Sanchez site where it now is parked between SN16 and SN15. It was here that SpaceX installed the aero covers on the aft flaps. So what is the news on the possible fate of Ship 22? After being asked on Twitter if a Starship could be sent somewhere to be used as a public display for the community, Elon Musk recommended the Brownsville Airport, to which the airport quickly responded saying that they are ready for it. Elon simply stated that he'll send one over. So yes, could he be talking about Ship 22 or one of the others? Let me know what you think. Either way, I think it's going to be fantastic to allow some of these historic prototypes to live on rather than being scrapped entirely. At the build site, more sections of the fifth level of the wide bay were lifted on top of the rest of the structure. At the total height here now, this makes it the new tallest structure in Brownsville. Over in the nose cone tent, tiling continued on Ship 24's nose cone this week, seen here in this footage. In front of that is what is likely its nose cone barrel, which has also recently received the heat shield tile mounting pins. The nose cone barrel also features internal stringers, but in this view they are only on the windward side instead of all the way around as we've seen on previous ships. So back on Monday night, the stand that was used by Booster 4 at the launch site was rolled all the way back to the production site to possibly assist with Booster 7 stacking. I was hoping that we may see that before this video went live, but hopefully soon. On Tuesday, a PA announcement was made at around 8.30am, stating that the pad would be cleared in an hour. However, it wasn't actually cleared for three hours. Soon after, Ship 20 began to vent, indicating that the vehicle was being filled with cryogenic liquids. This was soon confirmed when a frost line began to form on both the liquid oxygen and the methane tanks, and after a full cryo-proof test that lasted an hour, the frost on the tank walls began to decrease and both tanks were soon depressurized. Now, you may be asking, haven't they tested to this ship with enough cryo tests yet? And yes, that would be a reasonable question, but we suspect that all of these more recent tests are not so much for Booster 4 and Ship 20, but more to test out Stage 0, purge all of the lines, and ensure that the propellant loading processes are well understood well before a real static fire or launch. We expect to see quite a lot more cryo tests in the coming weeks. Due to the troubles with the two vertical liquid methane tanks that we talked about last week, that meant that SpaceX needed to expand their storage of methane with horizontal tanks. Over this week, five new horizontal tanks were delivered and one by one they were rolled in and placed alongside the already existing two horizontal tanks. This is going to hugely expand their methane commodity, so looking forward to RGV's next flight so that we can explore all this from above. 
Now, almost a week ago, SpaceX tweeted out this previously unseen footage of Ship 20 being destacked using the tower, as you can see here. This was some beautiful drone footage taken at an ideal time of day. Keep in mind that all of the complexity that goes along with what you are seeing here simply didn't exist at all a year ago. Now, I'm sure like me, you can get a little impatient and get frustrated at various delays. To a degree, Musk's predicted timelines don't always help there, but hey, optimism is useful as a leader and pushing for an optimistic goal is certainly a desirable thing. All that aside, think of how long it would take any other rocket facility in the world to design, construct and test what we are seeing right here. The complexity in the arms and the stacking system alone really is quite mind-boggling. I've been chatting a lot over the past few weeks with the amazing Ryan Hansen that is continually posting this sort of magic blurring the lines between render and reality. In fact, what many of you may not have noticed when Starship 20 was first stacked using the tower arms a few weeks ago was this slight adjustment shown by Lab Padre. Thanks as always to Lewis there having that very close up view. Now, if you blinked here, you might have just missed it as the camera was moved a little at the same time. Thanks to the views by NASA Spaceflight, we can also see it just a little if we can pair a few frames here. Did you spot it? Notice that the ship seems to move laterally there just a little. But how? The ship lift points on the chopstick arms look like they were mounted in a way that doesn't allow for any lateral movement. But just check this out. Ryan has beautifully rendered out how we believe this works. The top lift point on the ship appears to work like a ball and socket type connection, which is typically used in systems requiring some rotational adjustment. Since the pins have this ball connection on the end facing the ship, one could assume that the entire pin arm could rotate on a pivot point, necessitating the need to have a socket connection on the ship. Now further down, of course, we have the vertical stabilizers, which are a little bit more simplistic. They attach here and then lock downward, pulling against the main load pins above, which creates this nice tight hold. This vertical stabilization point below essentially now becomes a pivot point for tilting the ship as needed for alignment. The pushers used to align the booster can now simply push the lift pin slightly as a means of precisely controlling the rotation of the pin arms and thus the tilt of the ship. This movement of course is exaggerated in the animation here just so that you can understand how this works. In reality that slight pivot moves the bottom of the ship to assist in the fine adjustment needed for a perfect stack on the booster. That is pretty darn cool huh? A massive thank you to Ryan there for putting all that work into this. There is a much more detailed breakdown of all systems on the Mechazilla Tower coming in the near future, so make sure that you're following him there on Twitter and YouTube. The links are there in the description, so thanks for helping him out there. And as always, thanks for supporting what I do here as well. Such an honor to have you subscribe to the content. Just a few thousand away now for that 400,000 mark, all because of you. Now, if we head all the way over to Florida, late this week, Greg Scott took to the skies again over SpaceX's facility at the Cape. Starbase 2 might be an appropriate name for it, perhaps. Since the earlier flight, just a few weeks before, you can see just how much has changed. Fariel here was also up on the flight with him and took some beautiful footage as well. As you can see here, the groundwork at the back of Roberts Road is extensive. Just look at how much has changed there alone over a few weeks. The main building has had all of this new framing work done in just that time as well. Perhaps more interesting, we see the new round circular concrete foundation with the framing for a square pad beside it. Not sure exactly what this is going to be for. It's around the size of the nine meter wide tank structure for ships and boosters. Perhaps this could be a foundation area for ring forming or early stacking. For now, it's possibly a little too early to speculate to any accurate degree, but something to keep an eye on all the same. It also looks like a further two foundation areas for tower segments are underway as well, making it at least five that should be available. So expect some rapid tower building soon. Now, while up in the skies there, check this out. A short distance away at pad 39A, these huge propellant tanks have arrived just as they have at Boca Chica, so that is no coincidence. This old tank here is undergoing a lot of work after sitting here being unused for years. What the plan is for that at this stage, I don't know, but again, we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks a heap to Greg Scott there for doing these flyovers. Give him a follow there on Twitter if you use it. There are loads more shots coming in the future and a lot of fun conversations to be had in the threads. 
the cost to do these flights, as you can imagine, is quite extensive. So if you have the capacity to help support those as you do with RGV, a link to Greg's brand new Patreon is in the description. Now, just after we edited this down, actually, I realized NASA Space Flight also did a helicopter flight, which is awesome. They included in there similar detail, but also some interesting information on Blue Origin, and specifically LC-36. So check that out. A link to this is also in the description as well. So we had the first of two SpaceX launches planned for this week, kicking off on the 21st of February, the fourth Starlink launch for 2022. It was a glorious Monday morning for a launch, and sitting atop a flight-proven Falcon 9 booster, 46 Starlink satellites were good to go. After a launch delay of 24 hours due to poor weather conditions in the recovery zone, this day there was very little holding this beast back. Here we see, of course, it launching from Slick 40 at Florida's Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 9.44 AM Eastern Time. This is the 38th Starling flight, a number ticking up quite rapidly with SpaceX's launch cadence. Again, this one was heading south, but this time to a higher altitude target orbit, being dropped off at around 325 kilometers instead of around 210, hence the payload only consisting of 46 satellites this time, whereas the previous Starlink flights were carrying 49. Given that SpaceX lost the Starlink satellites from the previous launch due to solar activity, this new altitude should reduce that risk. The booster on this flight, designated B1058, had flown 10 previous missions already, most notably Demo 2 with Bob and Doug. This now being the 11th booster flight equals the SpaceX record for reusability set by a different booster flown in December 18th in 2021 with Booster 1051. So yes, this one is now tied as the reuse record holder. As they say, records are meant to be broken and we won't have to wait too long before that event either with one of these events heading to launch to take the lead soon. So yes, with main engine cutoff, stage separation, and fairing jettison, the second stage continued on its merry way to a successful orbital insertion. Speaking of fairings, Jesse here thought it was worth noting that SpaceX have got an overall fairing recovery rate of 93% over the last 14 missions, which just goes to show how many of these are being recovered, with 32 missions now having flown recovered fairing halves. In this case, these fairings were flying for the third time. Unfortunately, again due to these southerly launches which don't receive signal coverage at the time of deployment, we didn't see the Starlink satellite stack separating. That deployment was instead later confirmed on social media. Waiting on station near the Bahamas was of course the autonomous drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, and there you have it, a notable milestone with SpaceX's 100th successful recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage, or 107 if you count the Falcon Heavy side boosters. Skipping on now over to the west coast on Friday the 25th, we have Vandenberg Space Force Base hosting the second SpaceX launch for this week. Yep, more Starlink satellites. This time, the payload consisted of 50 satellites, and due to their extremely high flight rate right now, this was actually the fastest launch turnaround at Vandenberg's launch facility as mentioned in the live stream. The last launch from there was actually NROL 87 just three weeks ago. This was the fourth flight for this Falcon 9 booster, so quite a young one at this stage compared to the record leaders. That is why it still looks quite clean. And it was a beautiful day for the launch with clear footage right up to the stage separation. That meant that we could see those great views of the Earth below without cloud coverage getting in the way. The landing on the drone ship, of course, I still love you on this flight was choppy again, but another successful landing. And for this one, due to the orbit, there was the deployment coverage of the 50 satellites drifting away. Space SpaceX really do make this look too easy at this point. So a short time after Saturday's episode went live last week, Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket launched from Wallops Island in Virginia. This was the Cygnus CRS-17 commercial cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station with over 3.6 metric tons of assorted cargo. As is tradition, the Cygnus cargo vessel for this mission was named after Piers Sellers in recognition of his outstanding achievements and contributions to space exploration. So Antares isn't a colossal rocket, but it stands just over 40 meters tall. Comparatively, Falcon 9 is around 70 meters. Its 230 plus configuration was powered by the two Russian RD-181 engines running on liquid oxygen and RP-1. With a total stage one thrust of 4,170 kilonewtons, there we see it roaring off the pad for its climb to orbit. Here we see some great footage of the launch there by Daryl 2. Headphone warning here, this sounds awesome.
with the successful liftoff, these powerful engines were certainly on show. Stage separation all went to plan, of course, with the second stage engine firing up, powered by the Castor 30XL solid rocket motor. Everything going smoothly with the Cygnus freighter, soon it reached its orbit, unfurled its solar arrays, and proceeded to chase down the International Space Station, taking almost two days to reach its destination. Fast forward through the trip, and here we were, with Cygnus closing to within 30 meters, with the final OK to proceed, it closed to around 10 meters to be within the reach of the station's robotic arm. Raj Ashari was the primary operator of the arm, along with Kayla Barron acting as secondary. Once captured, control was relinquished to mission control to then berth the spacecraft to the Unity module. So it's actually going to remain berthed to the station until late May, but it's going to provide an additional service this time to the Expedition 66 crew on board. It's going to be the very first time that Cygnus will provide a reboost service to the ISS, which is of course usually done by the Russian Progress spacecraft docked at the Svesta service module. This has been a while coming with the actual maneuver for the reboost tested back in 2018 during the 9th Cygnus resupply mission. So many of you may be asking what a reboost is. Even at the height of the International Space Station over 400 kilometers in altitude, there is still small traces of atmosphere which cause a small amount of drag on the entire station. This slowly reduces the altitude of its orbit, and it's necessary every so often to initiate thruster firings to slowly raise it back up again. A great visual example here of a reboost is in action, as we see the ISS accelerating very slowly and leaving the crew behind. So aside from all of the assorted science and food goodies on board Cygnus, there was also all of the hardware making the trip as well. This consisted of nitrogen and oxygen tanks, computer equipment, CubeSats to deploy in the future from the ISS, and items required for EVAs just to name a few. Notably though, a power augmentation mod kit was delivered, and this is going to aid the installation of two iRosa rollout solar arrays scheduled to be delivered by the SpaceX Dragon cargo spacecraft at a later date. The Canadarm2 is also in for some attention with an upgrade to the camera lighting assembly. That will increase the light levels for critical operations such as berthing as we saw right here. So yes, in summary, this was a successful mission yet again thanks to cooperation from multiple companies around the globe. However, not to put too much of a geopolitical spin on things, there is a real dichotomy at play here that may not be known by all watching this. While Cygnus is built by US and European companies, the first stage of Antares is built for the most part in Ukraine and has Russian-made RD-181 engines. While the 2018 US National Defense Authorization Act limits purchases of Russian rocket engines after December 31st, of 2022. It doesn't apply to non-military purchases like Antares. United Launch Alliance also relies on Russian-made RD-180 engines currently to launch Atlas V. Both ULA and Northrop Grumman buy their engines from a Florida joint venture known as RD Amros, but the news this week with Russia and Ukraine, there are obviously concerns growing with that supply chain. Northrop Grumman's director of Space Launch, Kurt Eberle, said that they were watching developments closely and buying hardware ahead of time. How that works with sanctions imposed remains to be seen, of course. SpaceX have more recently begun launching national security payloads using its Falcon 9 rocket. Given the increased affordability, it wouldn't be too far out of the realms of possibility that SpaceX could be adopting a lot more of these down the track. Yet another reason why United Launch Alliance, who routinely use the RD-180s on Atlas, must be really pushing for Vulcan Centaur as soon as possible with the new BE-4 engines from Blue Origin. I think that we last heard that that delivery of the first few engines wouldn't happen until after the middle of this year. However, Tory did recently say on Twitter that ULA is anticipating flight-ready engines before then. Time will tell. Now, speaking of that same Twitter thread, Tori announced that ULA are not bidding on the launch vehicle for the Roman Space Telescope, which I think surprised a lot of us. More on that in just a moment, but first, thanks very much to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Brilliant is a STEM learning platform dedicated to helping anyone from kids right through to adults. You could be starting off as a beginner with the Math and Science Fundamentals courses. Perhaps you already know the basics. In that case, dive right into intermediate or advanced courses. These are beautifully broken up with interactive 
interactive hands-on examples. Not only that, it all works beautifully on mobile devices as well, so you can learn on the move. Just take their freshly revamped logic course as an example. Cramped in here is a load of material with many opportunities for hands-on problem solving. By simply dragging the robots here into the orders based on the clues, you get to have fun while thinking through the problem. If you're stuck, the hint prompts and material to guide you through is equally impressive. Other areas have many chess games to think over, such as this one with the cut down 4x4 version of the game. Exercises like these and many others open your mind and build that habit within you to simply explore problems in a completely new way. If you are naturally curious, then consider checking out Brilliant. By supporting them, you are supporting us here. So if you'd like to give it a try, head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description. Now, Tori Bruno, who is of course ULA's CEO, made this announcement just recently. If you're unfamiliar with the Roman Space Telescope project, that is perhaps because it was previously named the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. That is possibly not quite so catchy. This telescope is actually quite similar to the Hubble telescope in terms of what it can see, but this has the added benefit of being able to see an area 100 times greater than the aging Hubble. It will primarily be hunting down exoplanets, but it will also be further investigating the forces at play in the cosmos that are often referred to as dark energy and dark matter. So that is going to be a very exciting mission. Given that United Launch Alliance have decided not to bid for this mission, that almost guarantees that it will fly with SpaceX on Falcon Heavy. This telescope needs a beefy launch vehicle, even though its mass is only 4.2 metric tons. That's because, just like the James Webb Space Telescope, this is going to be heading all the way out to Lagrange Point 2. Now this isn't until at least 2027, but all the same, the fact that ULA is not bidding on the second most expensive NASA spacecraft to launch in the 2020s is really quite intriguing. So yes, you are all caught up with another week of space updates. As always, we'll be back with another next Saturday. Thanks a bunch for coming back yet again to check out all that is going on. Without you, we have got no channel. So it's all thanks to you right there. If you would like to support what I do, like all of these other incredible people scrolling up here, and to get ad-free video releases before anyone else, the links are below. Or if you'd simply like some Starship gear like what I'm wearing right here, that is a big help as well. As always, the tile in the bottom left today will take you back to the video from last week. If you missed it, lots of fun in that one with the first Polaris mission breakdown. In the top right is my latest video, the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everyone again for watching all the way through, and we'll see you all in the next video.